As the West corners Russia with crushing sanctions, will Moscow turn to Beijing? And how big a risk does China take by getting involved? We break down the pros and cons. Former U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is visiting Taiwan. There, he received one of the country's highest honors. And at the same time, a power outage impacted five million households on the island. New documents emerge about the National Institutes of Health, led by Dr. Anthony Fauci. Details reveal that officials may have known Beijing was withholding data on COVID-19 back in January 2020, before the pandemic broke out in the U.S. And for those watching our full episode, the Women's Tennis Association gets its largest ever title sponsor. It's first in over 10 years. It's all thanks to the group's action against China, following concerns about tennis star Peng Shui's safety. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Before we start, a quick thank you to today's sponsor, Sun Yun Performing Arts. Have you ever wondered what China was like before the Communist Party took over in 1949? This show depicts just that. Shen Yun showcases China's rich cultural heritage and what the regime destroyed, which is why the performance is banned in China. Captivating and uplifting, Shen Yun brings to life the legendary heroes of old, portraying the spirituality and deep wisdom present in ancient Chinese tradition. Shen Yun also features a unique live orchestra that blends both East and West, as well as animated backdrops, handmade costumes, and of course, classical Chinese dance. Get your tickets today at shenyun.show slash China in focus. And we have a discount code for you. Enter the code CNINFOCUS to waive ticket fees. This February, Chinese leader Xi Jinping welcomed Putin to the Beijing Olympics. Afterwards, the two countries published a joint statement, saying their friendship has no limits. Now, that friendship is being put to the test, with Putin waging war on Ukraine. And with more than 2,000 already dead in Ukraine, the West is doing something unprecedented, slapping coordinated sanctions on Russia. We're cutting off Russia's largest banks in the international financial system, preventing Russia's central bank from defending the Russian ruble, ruble, making Putin's $630 billion war fund worthless. I believe that Putin must fail. This package includes financial sanctions, that cut Russia's access to the most important capital markets. We're now targeting 70% of the Russian banking market. It will have maximum impact on the Russian economy and the political elite. The impact is immediate. The ruble has already lost 30% of its value. The Russian stock market has lost 40% of its value. And trading remains suspended. They'll probably reduce the size of the Russian economy by 20 percent. In the next year, uh, they'll be devastating. As Russia reels under Western sanctions, many are wondering if China will throw it a lifeline. But then there are other questions, like will China risk violating Western sanctions if it helps Russia? And how much help can it really offer? So far, Beijing has refused to call Russia's attack on Ukraine an invasion. It also claims Western sanctions don't have legal basis. We will not join such sanctions, and we will keep normal economic, trade and financial exchanges with all the relevant parties. The U.S. penalties ban American financial institutions from doing business with sanctioned Russian banks. Let's say it's... uh a Chinese bank in the United States sending money to Russia in some way, or, uh, you know, any Chinese company in Russia, in Germany, in any of these other places, then yes, then it's violating sanctions. But if Chinese entities within China do business with Russia, they're not violating our sanctions. There's a catch, though. Vialadis says with the most advanced economies in the world punishing Russia at the same time, it could make China think twice. The U.S. could decide, okay, China, if you don't want to help out in all of this effort, 
we're not going to buy as much in Chinese goods. And that's not a sanction per se, but nobody forces us to buy Chinese goods. So there can be all kinds of other tools that countries can use, um, dare I say, against China to try to get it to, uh, if not necessarily impose official sanctions, to at least not go out of its way either to help Russia. She says she struggles to see why China would come in and rescue Russia when everyone else is imposing sanctions. Uh, the more that the Russian government deteriorates, the Russia deteriorates economically and its political influence, it actually means that China now has a, a, bigger, pot, a bigger part of the whole pie economically, and it also means it has a bigger part of the whole you know, political pie. So far, China has lifted wheat imports from Russia. It also signed an energy deal with Russia on Monday. The latest agreement would set up a new pipeline and deliver over one trillion cubic feet of natural gas to China every year. Still, Violatis believes China's actions won't be enough to rescue Russia. Even if China decides to actively increase all the kinds of financial transactions and business transactions, it's not enough. Uh, it would have had to have started months and months ago to, to get all of this in place. David Goldman has a different view. He's an economist and deputy editor of news outlet Asia Times. It's not that China isn't willing to help Russia. China doesn't want to help Russia in a way that attracts the anger of the West at this point and makes its own situation more difficult. China will take no overt measures to help Russia evade the sanctions regime, but in many quiet and undetectable ways. China will help Russia sell oil, sell its exports and so forth. He says Beijing has a strategic interest in buying more oil from Russia. China has a concern in the back of its mind that oil that it buys from the Persian Gulf, delivered by tanker, could one day be blocked by the U.S. Navy in the case of a strategic confrontation between the U.S. and China. In comparison to dealing with those obstacles, oil from Russia presents a better option which it can bring in by pipeline overlap that's more secure than oil that goes by sea. Sanctions from the West so far have spared Russian oil and gas. The European Union sources 40 percent of its natural gas from Russia. China, I think, will exploit Russia's weakness, isolation and need to try to increase its energy sourcing from Russia on terms that are financially favorable to China. Goldman says over the long term, China stands to help Russia a great deal. China's economy uh, is roughly 10 times the size of Russia's. So there's no question that uh, China could, for example, buy uh, virtually all of Russia's oil production. Though he brings up concerns that the crisis will lead to a closer relationship between China and Russia. I think this will be a very bad development for the West. I would have much rather seen a closer relationship between Russia and the West than a rapprochement between Russia and China because a Russian-Chinese combination would be a formidable opponent to us. Goldman adds that the West might have miscalculated the impact of putting Russia into a corner. And even though he doesn't justify Russia's behavior, the consequences of a closer Russia-China alliance may not end well for the West. Though Putin and Xi Jinping's announcement of a new strategic partnership on the opening day of the Beijing Winter Olympics did mark a breakthrough, China's support for Russia did not start last month. The two have long worked together to skirt or reduce the effects of potential sanctions for the U.S. and its allies. That includes strengthening trade relations, gradually reducing reliance on U.S. dollars, and attempting to build an alternative financial system. According to the Financial Times report, Russia and China recently secured several energy deals that are mostly settled using Chinese yuan instead of dollars. The two started using their own currencies for bilateral trade in 2010 and opened their first currency swap line in 2014. Since then, the portion of trade settled through yuan between the two countries rose from 3.1% in 2014 to 17.5% in 2020. Yuan was used to settle 28 percent of Chinese exports to Russia in the first half of 2021, compared to 2 percent in 2013. 
Russia also increased the weight of Chinese yuan in their foreign currency reserves from 0.1% in 2017 to 13.1 percent as of June 2021. In contrast, the U.S. dollar's weight dropped from just over 46 percent to 16 percent in the same period. Former Chief Diplomat Mike Pompeo is in Taiwan to meet with the country's president. In light of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Pompeo's visit sends a message to Beijing and appears to reflect strong bipartisan support for Taiwan. On his four-day visit to Taiwan, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo received one of the country's highest honors. Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen awarded him the Order of the Brilliant Star with special grand cordon, praising him for boosting U.S. ties with Taiwan. Pompeo said he was proud of his achievements while in office. And I am so thrilled to see what I hope the people here in Taiwan will see, which is that these aren't partisan or political, but these are American commitments that are in our best interests, our American tradition, and in the deep interest of securing and building on the relationship between the United States and Taiwan. Citing the current situation in Eastern Europe, Pompeo asserted the need to defend democracy and freedom. If any of us were mistaken or complacent about the risk to that freedom, I think we need only watch what's taking place in Europe today to see that this continues to demand deep, concerted, focused leadership from those of us who cherish freedom. His call comes amid looming threats from the authoritarian powers of Russia and communist China. Those who desire to destroy freedom, to change human lives, will see quiet or the absence of direct language, recognition of the basic realities of the human condition as their opportunity. Pompeo arrived in Taiwan on Tuesday, just one day after President Biden's delegation reached the island. The back-to-back visits mark strong bipartisan support for Taiwan. In the context of Russian aggression in Ukraine, Pompeo's visit also sent a message to Beijing warning the regime not to capitalize on the current situation. Motorists, residents and train passengers in Taiwan were affected by a nationwide power outage this morning after traffic lights and elevators stopped working. Taiwan state-run power operators said in an update that the country was gradually restoring its power supply. This after much of the island's south and five million households were hit by an outage caused by a major power plant malfunction. The transport ministry says that normal service has also resumed on the high-speed rail line between the north and south after three trains were affected. Some parts of northern Taiwan, including the capital Taipei, also lost power. The Taiwan Power Company told local news outlets that this caused an instant loss of 10.5 million watts. President Tsai Ing-wen has ordered an investigation and restoration of power as soon as possible. The State Department and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases knew Chinese authorities were withholding data on the virus. That's what one expert says, based on documents that Judicial Watch obtained. Tom Fitton is the president of Judicial Watch. He obtained 90 pages of communication records between the National Institutes of Health, or NIAID, and the Wuhan Lab, the facility at the center of the pandemic's origin controversy. Fitton obtained the details from what a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit revealed. He says he believes the records show the NIAID has been hiding information on China's failure to provide essential data on COVID-19. Dr. Anthony Fauci heads the NIAID. The documents reveal that the agency sent experts from the P4 lab at the University of Texas Medical Branch to train technicians at the Wuhan lab. That was nearly two years before the pandemic started. P4 labs are secure facilities used to research highly infectious pathogens. On January 8, 2020, NIH and NIAID staff circulated an email from the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. Dr. Ping Chen was the top NIAID official in China. An email from him to his colleagues reads, Hi, here's the cable from U.S. Embassy Beijing reporting on the pneumonia outbreak in Wuhan, China. It has ruled out SARS, MERS, and flu. Redacted confirms it is viral infection. Also in the email, embassy officials raised a concern. They said a lack of epidemiological data made it hard for public health officials to make a better risk assessment and response. Adding that it's difficult to assess the risks to the U.S. and global health because the Chinese regime had gaps in the details and there was a lack of a final confirmed pathogen. 
What's more, Missouri's lawsuit against the People's Republic of China and the Wuhan Institute of Virology is seeing results. That's according to the state's attorney general, Eric Schmidt. He told the Epic Times program Facts Matter that it's not easy suing a foreign state. We've had to, we've sued uh, the People's Republic of China. That is uh, a process where you have to go through to serve the state through the Hague Convention, which they objected to. It's taken us a while to get service. Um, same on the non-government actors like the Wuhan lab. And so we're getting to a place finally now where we've got service uh, and moving towards, you know, they may be in default, but we're not going to rest. I mean, we want to seize assets. The suit alleges the Chinese regime covered up the virus in part by not alerting the world of human-to-human -human transmission until a month or two after they knew it was possible. And that's all for today's China and Focus on YouTube. We are now sharing a shortened version of our program on YouTube. That's after being demonetized for a year. Full episodes can be watched on our website, ntd.com slash China dash in dash focus. You can also find out where to watch us live on cable in your city at ntd.com slash TV or on NTD's partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, please click the link down below. Thanks for watching. I'm Tiffany Meyer, and see you tomorrow. The wait is finally over. Shen Yun returns to the stage with an all new production filled with beauty, majesty, and a powerful message of hope. Discover the lost culture of ancient China. Discover this season, Shen Yun 2022. A more wonderful world awaits you. Get your tickets today 